So welcome, everyone. This is meant to be the Designing AI Tools subgroup of the UCB AI community. You know, and I have a as a reference link to the, the general page on the UCB AI community. I think most of you know, as so many things in this topic area, it's it's new. Um, and uh, your hosts today are uh, Jake Tolbert and myself. Uh, uh, we we are looking after this this uh, designing AI tools subgroup and welcome to the inaug inaugural meeting of this this group. Um, Jake is with um, uh, University Development and Alumni Relations, and I'm currently for myself. I'm doing instructional computing projects across College of Engineering (EECS), um, College of Computing, Data Science and Society (RTL), and kind of this mix of stuff. Um, Today, uh, we, we're, we're going to get to check out a, a really nice, very specific use case of some AI technologies. Uh, and to that end, it's my pleasure to welcome Amina Kirby of Berkeley Law Media Service, Services. And she's recently developed an LLM-based help bot. And the idea is that this bot is to help with uh, classroom, AV, uh, classroom AV technical assistance, especially when the support staff isn't available because the schedule is use of that equipment you know spans uh, beyond the typical typical daily work hours and uh so today we'll have um we'll start with a, a relatively shorter presentation not the full hour but a shorter presentation of her experiences designing and deploying uh, this tool and some considerations and challenges and then we hope to uh, leave plenty of time for discussion and i really like this group size because i think we can have a nice good discussion rather than playing with all that question and answer business um, so with that, Amina, would you like, <laughs> would you like to take it away? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. For everyone who doesn't know me, uh, I'm Amina. I'm the, uh, senior AVIT engineer over at the, the law school. Um, and yeah, back in about, uh, I think it was maybe September, October, I started doing some research into as, you know, there's more discussion about chat GBT and, and just sort of the emergence of the, you know, LLMs um, started having some thoughts about you know potentially designing some kind of tool that uh, we could use in um, our media services department to and support faculty who you know where we may not be as available um, oftentimes in the evenings or on weekends if there's ever weekend classes um, to basically just design another tool that uh, our faculty might be able to use to assist them with any sort of AV technical issues in the class whether that be you know their laptop isn't displaying on a projector or um, their microphone isn't working or they're trying to get Zoom to work in the classroom and it's not working. Um, any any kind of AV questions, um, I, but the initial intention for designing, designing a tool like this was to um, assist specifically with AV and um, to ideally I was aiming to um, design something that had very specific knowledge of each uh, classroom AV system. So not just you know, not just how to turn up the volume on a microphone, but in, you know exactly where each button is, say on a on a touch screen in the room that controls um, the you know can, might control an audio or change a camera angle or something like that, or how to turn on the system, um, and you know more specifically like exactly where things are located in the classroom, so that it's it's really helpful and catered to specific classrooms. Um, so I think one of the you know initially when I started working on it, my idea was. Um, you know, I would essentially just build uh, a, a big long prompt that I was feeding into chat GPT. Um, actually, forgot to pull up the GPTs, the old, older GPTs that I've uh, used previously. But previously, the first sort of uh, creation of this was a big long text file. Um, I can sh show a demo of you know, what that currently looks like looks like or one of them looks like uh, basically in, initially i was basically just making a a big long text file like this i was um feeding into chat gpt and later on once the custom gpts were um, introduced into ch uh, chat gpt um that i was basically making a, a big prompt like this that i initially designed to have just specific information about every single one of our classrooms it's just like a single prompt file um, and while it worked, worked okay, there, um, uh, you know, there was a lot of things, a lot of things that it was lacking, um, you know, 
making a single prompt for all of our classes, it was difficult to provide very specific information about, um, you know, the classroom classroom equipment, because while a lot of our classrooms are becoming more and more uniform, there's still some classrooms that are quite a bit different than others and have different controls and um, different microphones and touch screens and things like that. So um, a big challenge was um, both how to create prompts that are tailored to specific classrooms, as well as how to actually manage that information over time as we say, you know, as a system, like an AV system is upgraded. Um, and so we have this, you know, if we were to have like a, a, a GPT for each class that has specific information, how do, how do we easily update it over time without going in and just, you know, manually editing a big giant text file is, is very unruly <laughs> um, and makes it difficult to maintain. Um, so a solution I came up with uh, to get around this um, was I... Um, basically put together a uh, big long Python script um, for folks who are familiar with Python or have used Python previously. Um, it's a programming language. Um, I used Python and basically broke up the prompts to individual chunks that um, certain classrooms may use. So, you know, certain classrooms may have common equipment like common microphones or common cameras or common ways to control them. So there's certain sort of similarities that different classrooms will have um, that I, in this script, I broke those up into individual chunks. And then um, at the end of the script could then create an individual prompt for each room where I could say, okay, this is classroom, say number 10. And I could add each chunk of the prompt to that to make it tailored to a specific class. Um, so I, I'm not, I don't think I'll pull up the actual Python prompt right now, but essentially, um, you know, similar to, to how this big prompt works currently, um, the script itself looks similar to this, except it's just an, an even bigger wall of text because it has, um, you know, individualized chunks of text that I'm then using to combine into um, a, a more unique prompt for each classroom. Um, yeah, so initially I made this script and I was able to make it produce, you know, unique prompts for each class and was like, oh, this is great. I have all these individual prompts. So I initially created, you know, a big list of GPTs within chat GPT, um, that, uh, I was then, you know, continue, continuing the test. And, um, as I was testing it and, um, as the AI group, was formed and I began uh, working with people like Greg to further test uh, some of the GPTs I put together. It became clear as far as how we were gonna be deploying it that um, uh, there were definitely a, a lot of difficult, you know, uh, difficulties or challenge, challenges to sort of figure out as far as um, how to get it to behave in the right way. Um, something also to note about this. So the, the idea of how we would be deploying this project would be on iPads in classrooms. So each of our classrooms has an iPad um, with a few different AV help tools. Like there's a tool to call meet, um, call media services if they have a technical issue. Um, there's a help page. And then, so this would be an, another tool on the iPad that um, would be used by faculty to um, talk with the GPT. So not only is it um, a chat bot, but it's a chat bot that's accessible by multiple people. So if somebody say, you know, depending on how we were implemented, if somebody say were to walk into a class and get a, get the chatbot to start talking about something completely unrelated or something potentially offensive or to you know to you know some com something completely unrelated to AV, um, uh, it was you know it was a challenge to sort out how do how do I create something that you know allows every time somebody asks it they get the same uh, prompt training basically the same experience each time someone is actually interacting with the um, GPT. Um, and the main solution I came up with for that, initially uh, I was working with the OpenAI API um, and then using an app within the iPads called uh, iPad Shortcuts. Um, so Shortcuts is an app that allows you to, it's kind of a programmatic language, but it's a very simple version of it. Um, but allows you to do things like um, make calls to other websites, like uh, like to OpenAI. So we could set it up so that rather than having you know a full chat GPT on each of our iPads, it could just be a shortcut that's actually just 
um, sending questions and then receiving answers back and forth from open open AI. Um, so that was in you know the next step that I sort of um, moved to as far as how to actually implement this in a in a you know safer way on our on our iPads that would ensure faculty would have um, a similar experience. Um, and while that worked, there are definitely some issues with it, and some of which were um, security. So uh, when making an API call or a, making a call to OpenAI from the iPad, there was a certain uh, token, or, or um, uh, in this case, it was called an API token, essentially like a um, a credential that's required for you know an external device to communicate with the um, API that we had set up on OpenAI. Um, and due to some, there's no real way in um, iPad OS shortcuts that I had found to obfuscate that credential. So essentially, you know, if somebody was sort of poking around one of our iPads, they could potentially open up the shortcut and look at the details for it and find our um, API credential, which is not good. <laughs> um, so, you know, the that method was proving a bit, you know, still not ideal. Um, so after working with Greg on it a bit and um, the the next step I started looking into is potentially creating a tool like this on, um, on Azure um, so that rather than our iPads communicating directly with OpenAI, it would instead um, communicate with the Azure and a uh, virtual machine on Azure which is then communicating with um, OpenAI. And then once it receives a response, then it sends that back to the iPads. Um, so that way there's you know, no, a, no uh, credential that's being sent um, or that's being stored on the iPads. And then um, also there's, it allowed, allows us to have more control over um, you know, both the questions being sent to, the, um, to Azure as well as uh, some security things we can set um, to basically limit what what devices um, can actually communicate with the API on Azure in the first place, as well as um, yeah, restrictions in uh, what kinds of traffic can interact with the API. Um, uh, one note also, so an, another similar on this topic, a uh, big um, issue that became apparent very quickly when designing a GPT, um, was that essentially, regardless of what kind of training I was providing a GPT and how many times I told it, never do this thing, never do that. Like when, no matter how, how somebody asks it, just never do this thing. Um, essentially, like if, it, if somebody has an infinite number of questions, they can ask a GPT. Essentially, it's, it's almost impossible to get a GPT to 100% all the time act exactly how you're wanting it to act. Um, so, Finding a, a way to basically limit the number of responses seemed like the only only way to really wrangle that kind of behavior in, so somebody couldn't get the GPT to ultimately just you know do whatever they wanted it to do, basically. Um, so uh, that was also another benefit to moving to more of a um, an API like uh, on Azure as opposed to um, just having you know a GPT set up on like a web browser or something like that that a um, faculty can communicate with that way uh, because thus far uh, OpenAI there doesn't seem to be any kind of limitations as far as um, you know limiting the number of questions or really designing something that's designed more for um, like a customer service environment where you may have somebody interacting with say like a chat kiosk or something like that which is more sort of what what our use case has been in the in the law school, or what uh, will be once this is implemented. Um, yeah, so here's a PDF that sort of just outlines how our how the AV Help Pod is currently set up. Um, so we have each of our classroom iPads, um, and then so when well. I'll step back a second. Actually, prior to showing this, um, maybe I'll just demo now sort of what the um, current uh, current bot uh, looks like on the iPad. So let me just share screen on this iPad real quick.
Okay. Everybody sees that. Yeah. So this is what our um, all of our iPads look like. Um, you know, uh, having a very standardized iPad layout um, has uh, been very important as far as you know, faculty being able to look at one iPad and knowing exactly what's on it when they go to another iPad. Um, so, you know, all of the apps on our iPads are basically located in the same folders in the exact same position. Um, so that if I were to train um, our chat bot to say know exactly where all of the iPad um, apps are, um, it would be able to tell a faculty. So say in this case, a faculty wanted to know where the PowerPoint app was. Um, so if I were to select the AV help bot like this, it's asking me if I want to talk to it or type. Um, so you can, they can either talk with it and say, you know, I don't know where PowerPoint is. But in this case, because it's connected to Zoom, the talk uh, option won't actually work. So I'm, I'm just going to select type. Um, so if I select type like that, and I say, um, I can't find PowerPoint on the iPad like that. So if I send that, it says it's sent. And you notice this next step will actually take um, sometimes up to 30 or 40 seconds. And the reason that for that is because currently the chat model that's being interacted with is GPT-4, um, which is a bit slower than GPT-3.5. Um, GPT-3.5, if I were to change this to 3.5, the, the response is almost instantaneous. Um, whereas four, depending on the length of the response, can sometimes be quite a bit longer um, of a wait time. But you'll see, so the response so PowerPoint is located within the presentation folder on the iPad's home screen. Simply locate the presentation folder, tap to open it, and you'll find the PowerPoint app inside along with other presentation-related apps. Um, so yeah, this is something that uh, a part of the training that received where I basically in, in the uh, part of a prompt that basically says, here's where all the iPad apps are located. Here's all the folders. and each app within each folder. Um, so if faculty ever asks a question like that, um, you know, the iPad can tell them exactly where the where the app is located. Um, some other questions, like if you know a faculty were say um, having issues setting up their Zoom and they wanted to ask, um, you know, how do I use this classroom for Zoom? And again, sometimes 30 or 40 seconds to respond. Currently, uh, this is an iPad that's, whoop, okay, there's a response. Um, this is an iPad that's currently set up in my office, although it's been um, prompt trained with one of our um, classroom prompts. Um, so it's imitating essentially what uh, one is certain one of our classrooms, the AV layout in that classroom. Um, but you'll see here, so um, this basically, based on the equipment in that class uh, provides is providing directions on how to, for the faculty to get their own personal computer plugged into um, our classroom system and have it set up for Zoom and which uh, audio sources and video sources to select when um, changing their audio and video sources in Zoom. Um, yeah. Great. And um, so another thing, if I were to continue asking the bot questions, after five questions, there's a, um, uh, it basically posts an alert that says you've reached your maximum quota. And if you need further assistance, please contact media services. Um, or if uh, they needed to continue talking with the bot rather than us, um, they would have to restart the conversation. Um, so, you know, if a faculty say had a question that had been a follow-up question, like say if they said, great, I'm connected to Zoom, say, but I don't hear the classroom microphones. So the bot will also, um, for the the quota of five questions, it will also still remember previous questions that were asked um, up until either this specific session has ended with the bot or they've reached that um, five question quota. Um, so. This is in uh, with the this was in the, with the intention of basically preventing um, someone from, as I mentioned before, you know, having an infinite number of questions and essentially kind of social engineering the bot to do all sorts of things like get it to talk about cupcakes or, um, you know, any anything they they see fit. Um, yeah.
And so that's uh, that's the bot. And then to the to go back to um, the slide I was just on a moment ago. Um, let me get out of this real quick. And you, yeah, so just to give a little bit more detail about on the back end, sort of what's actually happening when the iPad is communicating with the bot. Um, so when a question gets sent out, um, the iPad basically sends um, a packet of data. In this case, um, the packet of data is uh, packaged into what's called a JSON. Um, if For folks who aren't familiar, it's uh, basically a, a type of um, uh, in basically a packet of information that you can categorize, um, put labels on different um, uh, different, basically create yeah. sort of a list of values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah a, list of, a list of values, um, which then the bot can, um, the bot which is on um, the Azure VM can take and sort of analyze and parse out different things like parse out, say a, a question um, and then so basically, when a when an iPad someone asks a question, it gets sent to the to the VM. Um, it takes the JSON file and um, uh, pulls out the most recent question, which it then sends to the Azure OpenAI. So this is the actual um, question being sent to the LLM model um, to then create the response. Um, something else to note: uh, depending on the name of the iPad, so the actual um, you know, folks are familiar with naming, you know, different OS devices. Um, depending on the name of the iPad, the VM will also use that information to determine which prompt to select. Um, so on the on the virtual machine, there's basically a, a directory with a list of specific prompts for each of the classrooms. And depending on the host name of the device, which say, um, you know, in this case, might be iPad A, um, if the VM sees, oh, this is iPad A, so I'm going to pull the prompt for classroom A and then put that into the query, which is then sent to OpenAI. Um, basically, to ensure that depending on where the, the iPad is located, um, that the correct prompt is used when asking a question to, the, um, to OpenAI. Um, yeah, and in addition to that, so when that... Um, both when a question is asked as well as um, what response is received from OpenAI, um, that information is all also being stored um, on a um, um, on a on another list um, on the virtual machine, so that over time uh, we'll be able to use um, some of that information to basically better train our our bots over time um, to ensure you know they're better responding how how we're wanting them to respond to um, to faculty. Um, yeah, and I, sh I should also mention as far as um, any concerns about security with with our with our bot and what sort of information we're actually training it on, um, pretty much all all of the information that we're using, it's a kind of a you know in in our case, basically we're just providing very detailed information about how our AV systems work and how how someone would use them. So in the worst case scenario, if someone, if a bad actor were to say want to like have our our prompts or our you know our bot spill the beans and basically share its entire training prompt, all they're really learning is just how to really use our AV system very well. So there's no there's no FERPA information, there's no PII or anything like that. Um, it's all very you know very basic information that a lot of times they can just find on the um, Berkeley Law website. Um, so in, in that case, you know, there's a lot less concern in our use case to really um, take that into consideration, um, apart from, you know, just simply limiting the number of responses people can have. Um, I would say, yeah, anyone anyone who's designing designing a bot that may interact with more sensitive information, there's a, there's a lot more to consider and think about before you'd actually want to implement something like this. Because, you know, as I mentioned before, any bot like this is very easily engineered to do all sorts of things you don't want it to do. Um, yeah, so this is this is kind of the layout of um, how the bot all works. Um, any kind of changes to the virtual machine I can just make remotely um, from my laptop. Um, so I can just you know, remotely connect to the virtual machine and uh, make changes as as we need to or upload, upload new prompts. So if you need to update a prompt, um, also pull up. Um, so if, 
few uh, a few sort of quick commands I've uh, created to um, you know once they once I say generate um, a new a new list of prompts from the Python script I mentioned before. So um, here's say a folder full of all the all the prompts. If I want to move these to the virtual machine to be used with the bot. Um, I've created a few different sort of shortcut commands that, um, you know, just by running one of these commands will transfer all of the new prompts to the virtual machine and then erase the old ones. Um, so it makes it very easy and straightforward to, you know, update all the prompts if we say we wanted to add something like, oh, we're changing our working hours or, oh, we want to add, you know, another little, little section about making sure that the system's powered off after folks are completed with it. Um, it just makes it much easier to sort of create uh, and add changes over time as we um, as we see fit. Um, also, just to um, show what some of the response data looks like, I mentioned before that um, you know we haven't done anything with it yet, but currently uh, I've been collecting any sort of questions that are asked, as well as the responses that the robot receives that we could potentially use for future training. Um, what those files look like is. Um, essentially something like this is just a big long list of questions and then the responses. Um, you know, how how we're implement, we'd be planning on potentially implementing something like this into um, the bots training is something that I've still yet to, you know, we haven't quite gotten, gotten there yet and really haven't gotten a lot of faculty to test this out yet. We're actually currently just in the phase of, you know, introducing it to a few faculty to sort of get the, what the initial reaction and feeling is on it before rolling it out to all of our classrooms. Um, but as we get more data from faculty, then you know we can get more of an idea of how to better um, tailor our bots' behavior so that it um, better serves our faculty. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good overview of everything so far. As folks have questions or comments about anything or anything, I they'd be interested in me going over in a bit more detail or. Well. I, I, Thank you. This is super cool. I mean, I, I think I just want to just as a little note kind of from from my perspective about, I mean, you know, what you've done in a sense, you know, in, in one interpretation is um, so I think there's a fascinating mix of in the context of the classroom, a very specific context. This this bot is I'm going to use the word wide open and readily accessible by anybody when they're in that context and um, and sort of uh, uh, it. And when someone is not in that context, there are all kinds of ways in which you can't get to it. It just, you know, take the iPad somewhere else, you know, steal the iPad and hook it up to your, your home internet it doesn't work or, you know, all these kinds of things. And you've also done an interesting, um, in a sense, where is the app? Where does it happen? Um, you know, uh, you, you have a bit happening on the iPad and, and, but you have a lot more sort of moved out somewhere else. Um, and you can also do the central management. And you've also you, know, you talked about how this story began in a sense where you were um, uh, uh, talking about how to maintain uh, you know, the, the custom information from each classroom. Some information is shared and repeated across classrooms and some are very specific and you've kind of built some infrastructure to help do that. And then, um, uh, and uh, I'll, uh, I, I, as long as I have the mic for a sec, uh, I, I'm, I think maybe if I had to sort of guess at some of these, that the cloud costs, it, it's probably, I'm going to guess on, on the order of a dollar a day for that virtual machine and maybe pennies per, per conversation, something like that, roughly speaking. Yeah, to be honest, I'm still, I'm still sort of wrapping my head around the Azure, Azure billing costs. Um, also just a quick note, um, then thanks also to Greg, uh, Greg sort of helped us get set up with some uh, credits on uh, Azure so that, you know, I could actually sort of start test running this project. Um, thus far, from when I initially, you know, created the virtual machine on the on Azure and started, um, you know, uh, tinkering with OpenAI, uh, thus far, I believe it's only used um, for the past few months, I, I think it's maybe used $150 of the $1,000 of credits that we have. Um, I'd say the biggest cost is actually probably just hosting the virtual machine on Azure. Um, and that's been, that's also been um, with pretty heavy, you know, use with testing and sending, you know, queries over and over and over again um, to get things really dialed in. Um, as far as the open AI usage, um, from what I've seen it, uh, last time I checked, I, I believe it was a couple weeks ago, it didn't look like the cost was even more than 
like four or five dollars for all for all the testing we had we had done. It seemed like primarily the the main um, overhead cost was just the VM itself, um, which is a which is encouraging. But you know that said, if there if there was a model like this that was being implemented for say like the entire campus, like something like Triton. Uh, Triton GPT, if folks saw that, um, I imagine the cost of that would definitely rack up quite a bit more than in our use case, where it's simply existing on iPads um, in the classroom. And yeah, like uh, like Greg mentioned as well, not only is there sort of a check um, when the iPads make a um, query to the bot, not only is it checking the host name of the iPad, but also it's checking uh, the public facing IP address where it comes from. So say if somebody were to you know steal our iPads and then you know, take it home with them and start, um, you know, trying to send API calls from their home uh, address, or they were to say, you know, steal the shortcut from the iPad and then, um, or even just like the URL or anything like that for the, um, that's used to send messages to the bot. Any any of that that they tried at home and anything that's not on, um, you know, a, a Berkeley network, it would, it would not work. Um, so there's some rules. That's another advantage of setting it up on Azure in this case is there's a bunch of uh, network configuration rules we can set that you can't when you're just communicating directly with Azure or with OpenAI API. Um, so both limited the the IP addressing um, that needs to be received by the bot as well as the host name of the device. Jeffrey had a question about using like a, a Google chat UI instead of kind of the UI that you've built. I don't know, Jeffrey, if you've got a chance to come off mute or if you're around, you can maybe add more details to, or if you thought about that, maybe Amina. Uh, yeah, I hadn't really looked into um, the Google chat. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of API for Google, for Google chat that, um, you know, as I mean, essentially all, all this uh, is, is, you know, it's essentially just interacting with a couple of different APIs, one that has been built on the Azure virtual machine, another for the OpenAI API. Um, so really, if as long as there's some kind of API for Google Chat, I couldn't imagine it, you know, it, you know imagine it'd be totally possible to make like a chat, um, like a Google Chat version of this that could then just send like a chat message to um, like a virtual machine, which could then interact with OpenAI. I, I wonder in such a case, I haven't, uh, tried to work with Google Chat or, or a programmatic interaction, but I might I could imagine that Google wants wants to know the identity of of the person having the conversation, you know, with 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 a sort of a the other end, and would that mean people would have to authenticate, or and then you could they have long conversation? Would it? I, I don't know if there are ways to allow the kind of specific control like, that you've implemented for your context. Yeah, yeah, those would be questions I'd have too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Google Chat bots, you can you can do programmatic things, you know, there are some simp really simple ones where it's basically a question answer and the questions, the answers come out of like a Google sheet. So uh, you'd imagine like some of the, the separate rows for each of the different, each of the different, different uh, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer things. So uh, it, it'd be more if you, if you didn't want, uh, so that, that case would be if you weren't going to use large language model part of it, and instead, we're just going to have lots of fixed answers or relatively dy dynamic answers, but where you're updating them by changing the the rows of a of a Google Sheet. But the more complicated ones in Google Chat, the uh, the bots, you can then you know host them on the other end with kind of any programming language, even built-in ones like App Script, and have that talk to. OpenAI, so you would cut out the uh, the hosting charge for a VM. You'd have a free uh, UI layer. You'd have a free um, soft programming layer, and you'd only have the charges for OpenAI. So it's it's getting a little bit more interesting as Google Chat gets closer to parity with uh, with Slack, um, and, and as they continue their roadmap to to think about things like that, but. This is this is cool. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see kind of how you did kind of the uh, like retrie retrieval augmented generation uh, generative AI stuff, but but kind of you did it in in this way, and it's already done. Versus some people would like, oh, I'm still figuring out what well, I'm going to use Pinecone or which database am I going to use for storing all these things. You've already done it, and you you avoided a database. You avoided a lot of 
of possible complexity for yourself by just putting answers right there in in the prompts. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, kudos, that I mean, that, way to do it. I think. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, Jeffrey. Uh, the, the, I, I think from previous discussions, I think that you know those those big text files, one for each classroom, with all of the information about the classroom, um, is is that when that um, starts under the hood, when that starts a conversation, that that's the so-called system message. Uh, correct. Yeah. So for folks who are familiar with the OpenAI API and um, and how how you sort of package a message, which is then sent to um, OpenAI. There's a section before it gets to the sections um, where it's like a question and then the response and then another question, another response. Um, so there's another, there's a section at the beginning called system prompt um, or just system, um, which when uh, queries are sent, you know, the iPad sends a message to um, the Azure VM, which then sends the query to OpenAI. AI. Um, when it determines the prompt based on the iPad, the prompt is then put into that system part of the um, the JSON package, which is then sent to OpenAI. Yeah, so there's no uh, in in our in our use case, there's no knowledge base that the um, the bot is pulling from. It's all strictly just a just a prompt programming. Basically, there's no um, yeah, knowledge base that it's scraping information from or from our websites or anything like that. Uh, Maybe interesting to implement something like that later on if if uh, you know if it if it in, sort of improves the training, but uh, for the time being, yeah, it's just simple uh, prompt, prompt engineering. Yeah, I, think, I think what this shows is like, if, if you don't have a, like what we saw with Triton, if you're bringing us on Triton, if you if you're, you have a ton of stuff, you know, an entire website or HR's mass of PDFs or whatever, then a more uh, complicated RAG system, you know, obviously makes sense. But if you're creating a custom tool for a, a very, you know, more of a manageable amount of information, the uh, Amina's technique or custom TPTs or whatever. O OpenAI has that other um, custom instructions all kind of work a similar way. I think it's just piping in, into the prompt um, actually works. But I had a question for you, Amina. I know we've talked about this separately, uh, but maybe you can address it. The differences between um, using 3.5 and 4, you know, the actual differences in the quality and, and you know, what, the, what you found when you're playing with that. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I could I could potentially demonstrate it, um, but just uh, you know, des describing the differences. Um, GPT four is just uh, it seems to just better understand what um, what I'm attempting to communicate often in a lot of the prompts. They're just subtle things like a a big issue that I was struggling with when um, creating prompts for. Um, uh, each classroom in 3.5 is um, some, something like, uh, so in, in each of our classrooms, there's video cables that are available for faculty to plug into their laptop. And the other end of the video cable is always plugged into a video endpoint that the faculty never interact with and never should interact with. And GPT 3.5 just didn't seem to get it. Like it, no matter how many times or how, how I worded saying like, do not instruct the faculty to like plug or unplug the other end of the cable. It doesn't exist to them. Like don't, don't, don't ever consider it. And like, I would just start sending prompts and it, it would still just say, and then check the other, that the other end of the cable is plugged in. So just like li little things that, th that GPT-4 just seems to understand exactly when I have said something like, don't check the other end of the cable. It doesn't, it doesn't any, need any further sort of prompts, you know, engineering or, or any check that says, do not ever instruct this. It just understands that stuff straight away. Um, so there's things like that, that, um, are our big advantage to GPT-4. Um, the setback is that the response time is much greater currently. Uh, so it's a bit of a trade-off currently where if we wanted the bot to be just like right away, the moment someone asks a question, they get a response back. Um, I could switch it to 3.5, um, but the trade-off is the quality or the responses basically. And cost, I guess. <laughs> and, and cost, yeah. All right. There are, uh, in the... In the API calls that you can send um, to open open AI, um, there's some other controls that you have that you can't in just like the simple um, GPT or chat GPT window, like setting um, a temperature control. Uh, it's basically is a setting um, to how uh, 
kind of how creative the bot can be essentially in their responses, like how, um, how much it can, uh, kind of invent, invent responses and how much it, um, bases its responses on the, the prompts that were better given it. Um, so you can set the temperature, you know, the temperature can range from zero to two is the, is like a value that you can send, uh, set when making an API call. But if you set it to zero, it can, it can be very, you know, very plain, very cold, just, you know, this is what the, this is what the training I've been given, almost just like repeating the training without any, any kind of, um, you know, dynamic response uh, to a faculty. Whereas two, it can, you know, a little more apt to sort of go off the rails as much as it wants. Um, so I, I think currently I've set the temperature on our, our bots, all those responses to one. So it's right. right between those two. Temperature is super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> What about uh, when you get a, a prompt, a question rather from from the users, uh, automatically sending that live to a human as well? Not that the human has to respond, but just so that you know, hey, over in this room, there's something going on. Maybe I should start walking that direction. Yeah, we have another another help tool. Um, that if a faculty wants to interact with a um, with a, you know, wants to call a technician for help, which pretty much nine times out of 10, or really 10 times out of 10 currently, um, you know, if a faculty needs technical assistance more than what they can get um, in the classroom, they'll pretty much always want a person there um, to meet them. So if, you know, if they need a technician, they already have, there's a tool in place for them to basically call all of us over FaceTime. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in my own office, uh, I can set it up um, so I can basically be monitoring the um, the API on Azure um, to see anytime there's a question and what the response is. Um, so I can currently monitor it on my own in my own room. I could potentially set it up so that it um, you know could send a, some kind of message um, to all of our computers or to like a chat or something like that um, to so other folks are aware that someone's in a classroom asking a question to one of the AV bots. I think that's a really fascinating question is trying to imagine a user experience. And there could be so many use cases, right? It, it could be something, for example, someone felt, you know, they're trying to get their class started. They have a quickie question. They'll just, they're multi multitasking and students are coming in or something. And, and, and they, you know, let me send this question to the bot because my setup isn't ideal. You know, I, I, I'm using this camera, but I want to use the other one. Let me just send the question. Let me do this. Let me do this. And then someone shows up from AVIT and, and they're like, what? No, I'm no, I'm good. Thanks. No, I'm trying to get going. Right. And what you were you were eavesdropping, you know, right? I thought I was talking to the computer. Versus there's, you know, something is busted, you know, in the classroom. And the sooner you can know about it, perhaps if you're available, the better it is. So I think it's a very kind of interesting question. There could be so many ways in which that could play out, positive or negative. I yeah, I don't know what to think about that. Um, I was imagining like the best possible service, right? Like they ask they ask their question and then the bot is actually just stalling for time as it tries to answer their question and the human is racing over to that room and then the bot says, I'll be there, I'll be right there. And then the human walks in two seconds later <laughs> and, and solves the problem, you know, uh, but also, if you've got this going over to an API endpoint, have you thought about connecting the room's AV equipment to uh, PDUs that let you turn on and off the power to individual devices in the room so that you could reset the AV equipment that's having a trouble just based on someone chatting about it? Well, let your bot touch the other end of the cable, conceptually speaking, maybe almost. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That, I mean, that would be an interesting idea, though. Currently, I mean, especially with all of, you know, how how much a bot can be manipulated, trying to connect anything physical with a bot like this seems like a very scary idea to me personally. Like, I, I wouldn't want anybody to potentially have, you know, possible access to any AV equipment or they can flip relays to turn on and off equipment while a class is running. Um, per personally, to me, seems like a very dangerous idea currently. Um, but, I mean, having some control where someone could, say, walk into a classroom and, you know, Star Trek style, like computer turned the system on, or something like that. I, I can see that being a very to be a very interesting thing for for future. So long yeah. as it can actually be secure. Yeah, but maybe it's gate, gated uh, by by a, an additional check as well. Like maybe you've got a webcam that's there that's pointed at the front of the AV equipment and sees the red light, and then 
if and only if the red light was on, then it allows you know resetting the thing because the light's supposed to be green. It's always gr supposed to be green, <laughs> of course, right? Um, right. You know, th things like that, which might it seem crazy, but actually it's just, it's the technology that you are expecting to be working anyway. You're expecting a webcam to work in that room. You're expecting uh, audio or video, or all these different technologies to work in that room networking. So if you rely on the same, those same uh, technologies, you might be able to make something that's really amazing. Uh, yeah. And yeah. yeah, yeah, sure, scary too. But if you can, if you, for example, can't ping that device, you know, one of one of the pieces of, of equipment there, and they're already asking about it. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, why not remotely turn it off and on? But mm -hmm. if they didn't ask about it, then they must not need it. You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a super interesting idea. If you could like really restrict what was uh, possible to particular things, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we currently, um, for uh, more and more of our AV systems, we currently have some cloud software that we can use to remotely monitor um, devices in the classroom. So you know, in terms of restarting devices or checking the status of devices, like we could very easily see, you know, looking at API of that up with a, with a chat bot, um, that'd, be, that'd be very possible to do something like that. I like to think where this could go with visual input and not only, you know, you mentioned control, but like there's cables, there's stuff like, obviously we're, it's a little ahead, but I mean, there's GPT-4 with vision. Like if there was a way for GPT to get an, it, it, to, to see the space, oh, I can see your cables plugged into the wrong thing. Something like that, right? I mean, that would be. <laughs> I've done little things like that. Um, well, that is to say, uh, have a very different kind of bot where if I send a message, it sends it to a classifier, which makes text a detailed text description, which sends that as a behind the scenes prompt to the LLM and then it responds to that. So nice. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Initially, I, I was uh, toying around with that idea a bit or somehow linking like Dolly up with uh, a GPT that, you know, could describe like I, you know, if a bot says like I, you know, I don't know what a gooseneck microphone looks like or um, things like that, but um, at least the, you know, in the, the, the phase that Dolly was out when I was testing that, uh, it definitely was not returning a, um, you know, some of the descriptions of some of the things I was asking for, like a gooseneck that looks a bit more like a, you know, Picasso <laughs> rendition of a, of a gooseneck microphone as opposed to what it actually looks like in a classroom. So, but yeah, having, having some sort of image verification um, or, you know, uh, linked in with a bot seems like there's definitely a lot of a lot of potential to even great you know greater like expand a tool like this to uh, better serve somebody in a classroom. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts about this tool or other? Uh... I'm I'm curious if there's anybody else in this group that's working on something like this or thinking about something like this for their their department. Any interest out there? Uh, Use cases. I've done some thinking about uh, routing of support tickets. Like when support tickets come in, there it's oftentimes that that the AI would give the wrong answer to a support ticket. And, and it's too wild and woolly that kind of the, the options, all the different possible things that someone might ask about in a support ticket. But if you allowed it only to classify which bucket to send, to send it to, you could save a lot of tier one time and immediately, you know, or more quickly get it to the right team so that the waiting time for the customer would be shorter. So even if you weren't going to answer the question or potentially answer, like draft a, an answer to the question and have that sitting there in the notes in in the ticket. So here's the tick question that came in. Instead of going to tier one, having tier one try to triage it um, themselves, maybe it's it's a little bit, some of them would be, would go to a bucket that would still go to, to tier one, but, but many of them that are kind of the automatic escalations that they never do any follow-up on, 
and you, you know, then sending those right to the tier two team that's responsible and maybe having it suggest some answer or some follow-up questions and those kinds of things. Uh, I've, I've been thinking about that and um, it seems like that could, that could be really useful here, but we also have like way too many trouble ticketing systems. Like I'm from a school that had one, like 80 plus help desks consolidated to one. Here we have like tons of different things, like not just service now, we even have two service nows. Like, <laughs> and then, and then we've got, you know, all kinds of other ones too. So like having like one point of entry to then, and then the tickets come in and they get all sorted to which team they go to and stuff and maybe having some help. Yeah, you could write that for one of the instances, but then there's still like tons of other ones here. So um, our design is pretty uh, distributed. So uh, it'd be hard to fix problems at a scalable way when there's just so so much uh, diversity of uh, solutions that are being used. But, you know, before our, our time's up, I wonder, um, you, Eugene, I, I wonder if, if you could if you could just give us your thoughts at a broader perspective. You know, thanks for joining us today. Uh, if you have any just impressions or things you'd like to to share a comment on. Sure. The, this discussion has been a lot about the details, but I think we should take mm -hmm. a step back and say, like, this is really cool. I think it's really cool that an employee just said, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> right. And I wish more of our employees would feel like they work in an environment where that kind of behavior was encouraged and supported. We are very, you know, what happens if it goes wrong kind of a place to work as opposed to what happens if it goes right or we'll try it, we'll pilot it and we'll, and we'll learn how to get it right by making mistakes. And so for those of you who are considering doing other things or who know people are going to encourage them to do it and to try because the reality is, even if we do it and it makes mistakes, nobody's getting in trouble. Nobody's getting fired. It doesn't happen. Some people are really going to wring their hands about it. And oh my gosh, you, we need we need to really push forward. I I am particularly supportive of all this kind of stuff in our own unit. So we we all of my leadership team we pay the twenty bucks a month to have Chat GPT four, and I and I ordered them. Everybody's got to use it for their work. You just have to. Right. I didn't, there was no campus process or approval, at, like, but we, we can't be left behind. One of the things we specifically wanted to do was to load all campus policies into chat GPT and create basically a box so that you can query policies. And with the version we have, you can only load a certain number of documents. So it's not enough to cover all the policies, but something like this, we should have it. We should do it like the Triton GPT somebody mentioned. And so I want to have their GPT or whatever we call it, that does all of the exact same things. There's no reason why we shouldn't have it. But I think these little experiments, as many of them as we can do, we should we should absolutely be doing them because I think we can't rely on campus leadership to pull us along. We have to really push them along. And part of it is by one, it's happening too. Look at these neat things we can get it to do. There's a committee, the provost is forming a committee, a camp, something on AI, a governance thing. And you know wants us to be coordinated and all that stuff, which I find to be laudable because we don't want to have five enterprise licenses for something, right? Which we do sometimes, really, really dumb. So coordination, yes, but I'm concerned about the governance being a gatekeeper to ideas and innovation. Well, you know, these twelve people didn't sign off on doing this thing, and so you know, or you know, eight of the twelve objected, and so we can't. No, like. So I encourage you to continue to move forward, particularly in this window of time where there are, there is no, there are no real roadblocks other than your direct supervisor saying no. And if you know people who need support or want support, you know, pushing stuff ahead, I am happy to like have a conversation with people to, to help make this happen. But I've, I've worked closely with Bill Allison on a lot of these things. And, and he's of the same mindset that we need to, you know, we need to keep, we need to start trying these things. And also, it makes it a more fun place to work for people who get to try to do stuff like this, right? We're not paying you enough and all, all the things that you know, but hey, we get to be innovative in work, not just the folks in research labs. The people who work here, we can innovate as well too. And so I, I certainly greatly encourage this. Thanks, Eugene. That, that, yeah, that, that great things to think about. Yeah, that, lots of good stuff. Yeah, thank you. We are close to end of time, so I want to respect people. I know there's probably many of you have a Zoom coming up in, you know, 13 seconds. <laughs>
Um, and thank you very much, Amina, for 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 sharing this work, and and thank you for folks who've joined. And I'm sure people can you know feel feel free to you know, email and chat whether to you or the AI community. Or I'd love to if people are working on stuff and want to talk about sharing it, even if you're just kind of playing with stuff. You know, Jake and I are you know we need topics and and speakers, so just feel free. And um, uh, thanks again. I guess I'll turn off the recording.